Hi everybody, everyone here and at home or online. Um, I am Chinea Chukwuka. I'm an M2 Unit 7 student at the GSA. I'm very excited to introduce Panel 2. For Panel 2, we will have Aleandro Hayek, Cole, um, Karine Dupre, Professor Yasin Lukan, Michelle Gorman, Yolanda Morkel, Dr. Hermie Delport, and Lindy Osborne Burton. So I'll be introducing Karine Dupre if she is here. Can you say hi? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very sorry that I cannot make it today, but uh, I'm very happy to be able to send you this small video and to present you my work on international experiments in Australian architecture curriculum from an educator perspective. I'm Professor Karine Dupré from Griffiths University. And before I start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I work and I live, uh, and uh, pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So the broad context of this research is about internationalization, and um, there has been quite a significant scholarship specifically focusing on activities, competencies, culture, and processes involving internationalization. Uh, however, there are a couple gaps regarding mostly the discipline of architecture. There are not so much scholarship uh, around architecture. And the other thing is that um, there is a gap also looking at the uh, educator's perspective. Uh, for example, um, John did a um, investigation on the experiences of international students, but I didn't find the equivalent regarding the educators. Uh, Costa and Colma did look at, at the English medium uh, in Italy, but that was again from a administrative and from a student perspective, not so much about from the educator point of view. And um, there was also uh, other uh, article um, that didn't develop that much about the educator perspective. So the aim of my study was actually to understand the relationship between the uh, educators and the internationalization and to uh, understand whether it was more like an individual uh, type of leadership or if it was much more institutional. The other important thing that is important to do uh, with this small uh, context is basically um, the context of Australia. Uh, there has been a lot of incentive uh, to um, generate financial and intellectual benefit with Asia, uh, and that is still going on. Um, and this is closely aligned with the political and economic uh, agenda. Um, as a result, uh, already, um, not already, but for a long time and up to 2019, not anymore, uh, but it's coming up. Um, Australia was the second most popular destination in the world for uh, study abroad after the United States. Uh, and um, if we look at specifically uh, in the architecture program, overall, bachelor and masters, uh, international students did represent 35% of uh, the uh, enrollments and for the uh, master's students up to 45 percent. So it's quite significant and it's why it's quite um, important actually to look at what is happening there. So from a methodology perspective, I did use a mixed method uh, where I mixed quantitative and a qualitative approach. The first one was a desktop study where I did actually um, um, inventory all the architecture educators in Australia uh, the, from the 18 schools. Uh, but there was one limitation is that I did focus only on the continuing position because uh, the sessional staff uh, don't have the same level of power and capability in um, developing and changing the curriculum. So it's why I did uh, use that uh, um, criteria. However, 77% of, um, uh, of uh, the teaching staff in uh, architecture school in Australia are actually sessional staff. So it would be interesting to look at their point of view as well. Um, 
Then from a qualitative approach, I did conduct a survey and a follow-up interviews asking uh, those educators, so I found 385 educators in Australia, uh, to add them about their relationship with internationalization and how they felt about uh, the uh, leadership and what was the preferred mode of uh, <coughs> sorry, implementation. Um, so, um, another limitation that came up was that I did this study while it was COVID. Uh, so, unfortunately, it did limit the results. Everyone was learning to use online teaching and so on. So I had only 42 responses out of the 385 educators, which represent 11 persons. So, it's not that bad, but I had only eight online interviews. Everyone was uh, was overwhelmed. Um, the other limitation concerned the accuracy of the websites that was not always very accurate, and the fact that some people uh, did leave their uh, institution while I was doing the study. So the first result from this study was quite interesting in terms of uh, cultural background because uh, basically architecture indicators in Australia do mirror the diversity of the Australian society uh, in numbers. Uh, in Australia, you have almost 39% of the um, um, population which is born overseas, and in uh, our study, uh, we found more or less the same type of percentage within the school of our, uh, architecture. However, there was a bit of discrepancy between the origin of Australian residents, the origin of the educators, and the origin of the international stud students. Um, and it shows that in terms of educators, there is quite a skew toward the English-speaking countries with an Italian anomaly. Uh, the Italian colleagues are quite well represented uh, in, um, in Australia. But if you look at the origin of the uh, international students, they all come from Asia. Uh, and this is not um, this is like this uh, predominance is not reflected in the educators. In the same way, the uh, predominance of uh, China and India is not so much represented also in the educator. So, one thing also that came up from the interviews and the survey, it showed that um, there is not at this stage uh, a conscious strategy that aligns with the societal uh, diversity currently existing or with the international student profile. Those data are not discussed and they are not um, worked upon. The second result that came up is about the international experiment themselves. Basically, there is a strong um, uh, location or like a preferred location in Asia. Uh, and that, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, is due to the, fin to the financial incentive uh, from the Australian government. The good thing also is that almost all the program have at least one international experiment. So this is not um, anecdotal. Um, this is something that all the university are undertaking. Um, in terms of looking at the types of international experiment, there are mostly study tours, travel studios and workshop studios. Uh, but the uh, focus, as we can see in the word cloud, is really on design. Uh, that is not surprising coming from architecture uh, program, uh, but uh, basically it means also that uh, it's only a type that is predominant and that um, there is no question or no innovation maybe with other type. Um, another result was that there is a weak correlation between the place of those international experiments and the educator's background. Only 13 percent were 13 were related to the educator's origin, but otherwise that was not at all. Um, so the drivers again, the state finance and uh, the curiosity and personal trait came as a very strong driver. So 
Definitely, internationalization is used as an instrument for creating a deep, authentic learning experience uh, that teaches the skill of a global practitioner. That was also one of the um, results that came up uh, with the um, data collection. At last, uh, the third and final result regarding the innovation and leadership. So I, I wrote in the title a richness to unveil because the most striking element that emerged from that study was the fact that there is uh, very little scholarship. The educators who are undertaking international experiments don't write so much about it. And because of that, they keep hidden uh, any type of innovation, any type of uh, very interesting project they are doing. And so we can't get the support from uh, those knowledge being created and from those intercultural practices. So that I think is a pity. And the same way, because of the lack of um, um, scholarship, it does raise question regarding the quality monitoring and analysis of this project. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of us know at least one that was a fiasco that didn't work well. Um, and I think even that it would be interesting to report and to write on it to have a critical reflection. So I think overall, uh, it does mean also that um, there is, how to say, uh, not yet quite uh, a um, internationalized syllabus and interest uh, to look at, at it from a driver uh, to increase or to change or to improve practices both in pedagogy but also uh, later on in the industry. When that was actually quite reflected also in the course profile, uh, because when you look at the course profile and you ask the course convener about um, the learning outcome, course profile did look at, did look very similar to what uh, the accreditation board suggests as a graduating attribute. Uh, but in reality, the educators talk a lot about communication, collaboration, uh, about intercultural skills and so on. And those uh, skills and competencies are never announced in the uh, learning outcome. So it's a bit of a pity and it shows again that there is not this lens uh, of internationalization while creating the syllabus. And at last, in terms of the, the leadership, um, it was basically summarized by one participant, uh, institutional leadership based on initiative of individuals. So very often it's thanks to one individual that internationalization does happen um, and um, they are not really a full system in place or implemented in any of the university that I did survey. Um, so it means again, it reinforced the, the finding about the uh, lack of uh, internationalized syllabus or reflection about that. So in conclusion, um, we can say that overall there is no direct link between the educators and their international experiment location uh, that is most likely due to the curiosity, the, um, also the um, um, engagement of the educators, uh, that there is a design studio pedagogic uh, hegemony and that is actually um, also quite um, surprising and quite um, raising some question because um, it does mean that um, maybe when we do international uh, experiment in the South, global South, uh, we don't come up enough with a broad perspective that it could be done differently. So it's why further research might reveal um, other uh, factors, not factors, but uh, the uniqueness and variety of the context specificity met in the Global South. And I think that would be important to investigate further, to come back to the educators 
we didn't I didn't find any link, but if we were looking at their um, life journey, at their experience as uh, educators, um, maybe then we will find more uh, factors uh, influencing their choices. And the other research that could be interesting is actually to have a comparison with other countries to see if this focus on Asia is similar, for example, uh, in New Zealand because of the proximity, or if it's the same, uh, for example, also with uh, New Caledonia, one of the French territory very close to Australia. Um, that could be interesting. And the last thing I wanted to conclude with is the fact that uh, actually when COVID hit Australia, we went into a quarantine, uh, the uh, borders were closed, so no student could come in, no internationalization anymore, so we lost all our international students. And that was quite drastic, and that was quite a good uh, example that the neoliberal funding model can't be sustainable. And this is also an opportunity to reconceptualize internationalization and to open new pathways to redefine critical engagement uh, and reconsider our knowledge. Thank you very much, uh, and um, I hope you will have many questions. Bye. Thank you, Karin. Um, so our next guest is actually here with us, um, Professor Yassine Lukan. Hi there, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so the name's Yashen Lakan. Um, I'm happy to be here. Welcome. And uh, I think the conversation thus far has, has set the context very nicely. And, and um, Harriet's uh, presentations last night and today have said a lot that make us think about the way we think and what we do. So my, uh, I just want to outline my areas of research and publication. It's in inclusive cities, which is very exciting, uh, decoloniality, and uh, pedagogic transformation. I'm just going to warn you architects that love to be seduced by images and pictures. You're not going to get any of that. Uh, so me as well. Uh, this one's probably the most um, yeah, I've got to survive my own presentation, but I hope you you kind of enjoy it as well. So we talk about recognition of prior learning, contentious topic here, uh, RPL for redress and spatial transformation in South Africa. Um, now, I want you to read that. Um, and that's from an RPL book that I wrote in Rutledge published in 2021. And that was my dedication, which has sparked and it has been the reason that um, I have taken a certain approach and a certain kind of um, critique of, of education and the systems in South Africa. Now, through that, as a child of that person, my dad, my journey through architecture had to be 20 years to become an architect. And nobody, hardly anybody in South Africa knows that. And of those 20 years, I had one year of full-time study. So I had to work and study, work and study, and study through different systems, from the old Technicon, uh, through the, the, the University of Technology, through uh, a traditional university. So that journey had been from, you know, the old T1, T2, T3 drafting courses, through a technology course, to a bridging year in design and theory before I got into my BTEC, uh, where I excelled, it was a BTEC in up, applied design, which got me into academia. And then while working, et cetera, found a gap at one point to access the BARC Advance at UKZN, which I grabbed and carried on. Well, then that transformed into a master's, which became very research intensive. And it, I mean, that was like, I qualified uh, 20 years later and registered as a PR arc with SACAP uh, exactly 20 years after leaving matric. Now, I could be a victim of this and be all sad and, and, and uh, you know, teary about it. But in a way, now, retrospectively, I thank whatever forces for having given me that opportunity to go through this long, arduous and highly articulated journey along different learning pathways 
Because I might have been just conditioned uh, and indoctrinated to think that I'm an expert that can impose my ideas on society. So that really re led to my interest in RPL because of my own journey. And my doctorate was very different to my master's. My master's focused on cultural identity in the build form. My doctorate was really challenging uh, educational systems, which for an architect is quite boring, but I really, some, that, that passion and burning, the, the kind of fire in the belly was driven by my own experience as a child who had a compromised life because of my parents. Um, so I was first generation tertiary who could not excel despite his um, intelligence. Um, now, the reality now is that in South Africa, we talk a lot about transformation, redress, and all of that. But almost 30 years into democracy, marginalized persons are increasingly more marginalized. There's more inequality. There's more oppression. And that's because of our entrenched uh, perceptions, attitudes, and assumptions of the knowledge society. So it's about not it's about epistemology, uh, epistemological positions, but also ontological, how we understand the nature of reality and what we are in this world. And what's our consciousness? Is it all about ourselves, or we relate to this? And I like what Harriet said yesterday, not about the only the Anthropocene, but how we exist in this entire globe of beings and all creatures and systems. Now, practitioners who were disadvantaged and could not, let me, oh, goodness me. But, okay, fine. Who could not access um, higher education meant that they grew up in communities like, like townships uh, who had to rely on outside assistance. And being excluded from, from a system Many of these uh, learned their skills through practice and working in industry. It meant that they could not transform their livelihoods of their own communities, nor their families, nor could they do anything about bettering the quality of architecture in those communities, which architects generally seem to have, uh, or oh, the communities were gen generally seem to have eluded architects. Okay. What that meant was that there's an outflow of the wealth of communities. We would, as disadvantaged communities, uh, import skills and pay for those skills of practitioners who will come in, produce something, impose an idea on a community, on society, and their lines on society, and then leave with the money. That's not really good. So RPL has, has you know, quite a few layers to it. And I refer to this as, you know, if you think about the policy makers, the preachers of transformation redress, in fact, it's transformation hypocrisy through privilege, because everybody, including myself, yeah, I'm sitting in a position of privilege, talking about the realities of communities that are really struggling. I had some experience, but I really, uh, through our students uh, and their journeys, and other people who cannot access higher education and, and do anything about their livelihoods, uh, we should realize that we are in a very privileged position and we, to, we need to use these privileges for the advancement of others holistically. So while we may feel oppressed as a profession, we may continue to implicitly oppress others through our privileged positions. And why? Why do we do this? Because, because of our inherent insecurities. We are always defending our domains. And when we stop defending our domains and realize that we are just dwelling in a much bigger reality, then we may start to question our preconceptions, misconceptions, disinformation, uh, and, you know, and actually playing into the historical gatekeepers who exist at various structures, okay? And the one challenge to RPL is that it seemed to be seen as a kind of a, a background, a, a shortcut to qualification or funny uh, perceptions. And these things compromise and sometimes intentionally comp compromise public confidence in alternative learning pathways. So RPL is just one mechanism uh, through, and it's about alternative learning pathways. There are many others. Now, I just said, RPL is not a shortcut. So my challenge was to prove that it's an alternative 
complex learning pathways, pathway, right? Uh, so my chapter in the book, uh, The Architectural Pedagogies of Global South, also speaks about the publication of 2021, which is uh, that one. It's about redress and spatial transformation, which contributed uh, and kind of challenged this notion of RPL being less quality assure, assured by actually producing or, or innovatively developing a model for quality assurance of RPL. So it gets quite technical, and this model can be applied across disciplines and fields. And it's important to notice uh, to note who benefits from RPL. Often we think it is uh, you know those practitioners who are stealing the works of the architects. No, not really. Uh, those may be referred to the missing middle or mid to late career practitioners who run practices, who have worked in, in, in kind of uh, large practices and gained a lot of skills and knowledge, but could not access higher education or higher professional education due to historical barriers. And they, and they are also pedagogically excluded because their lived and worked experiences do not factor into the curriculum at all. The second group is stop out students, and that's a real problem we have right now, where students can't afford to spend, I mean, just to, to make it through an undergraduate degree, you know, uh, financially is, is very strenuous. But we require them to, to, to be here for five full years of study. So those are institutional structural exclusion barriers. And then practitioners with outdated qualifications who now can't contribute as much as they could have or would have in the past into this kind of um, higher degrees or masters uh, and beyond because they themselves don't have masters degrees. So though they are also excluded by institutional structural exclusion and pedagogic exclusion because they're not bringing their vast experiences into the curriculum and into the program enough. So quality assurance to build uh, uh, public confidence. Now, South Africa has a serious problem. We talk transformation, but our profession is, is kind of uh, fraught with hidden structural exclusion. If you look at architecture in South, uh, South Africa, it's a, strategi a stratified profession. It has four professional categories of registration, which maybe is the start of many problems. So I had to look at, you know, and, and there's there, these four levels, the only way to articulate or the, or the standard norm is through the NQF, right from higher certi certificate level at NQF level five up to PR arc at NQF level nine, and then the doctorate is 10, but PR arc, okay? Um, now, my model, you know, it realizes that we are bound by a lot of legislative uh, frameworks. And I mean, St South Africa, we are highly re regulated. We rely on the RIBA, the UIA, um, uh, UNESCO Charter, uh, CAA, and, and Canberra Accord accreditation things. So I looked at kind of progressively deconstructing these frameworks, not to like throw the, the baby out of the bathwater or anything like that, but how do you work with those? So SACAP has the 10 competencies which we are aware of. Um, and each of the professional designation categories are registered with SACWA, the South African Qualifi Qualifications Authority, and there are certain uh, level outcomes there. One of the problems is, although you have the NQF and the, and the, and the Higher Education Act as transformative frameworks, uh, the problem lies here in academia, and this has been talked about unfair gatekeeping used as quality assurance. So the jury bias and the trauma and violence against students in the system. Now, so my model was trying to demonstrate that there is a prop, there is a way of objectively, uh, you know, critiquing and evaluating student work. And it's about the evaluation should be, shouldn't be subjective, but what we should appreciate is that student design projects are subjective due to lived experiences, right from the time they're born until they produce that particular design. However, an RPL or any assessment that, 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 is, that has to be considered valid and reliable in the current, within the current frameworks, will have to kind of have certain objectifiable assessment criteria. So the model was based on matching national qualifications frameworks, exit level outcomes, with professional competencies 
and looking really at orders of thinking and, and intellectual engagement or engagement through intuition and design with the work. Um, so at the center of the model, uh, an RPL portfolio is always what's looked at, right? So it's a situated problem-based learning portfolio, situated. That could be situated in practice, in a community, in the university, where, wherever it is. And the two things that, that determine the strength of that portfolio is the exit level outcomes as per NQF SACWA level descriptors, but also on the other side is the competence gained through the workplace, through practice and through living life. And these SACWA kind of descriptors, knowledge, you know, the, the actual uh, orders of thinking from knowledge up to synthesis or creation feed into that. However, you can read all of that technical stuff in the book because then I created a series of tables, uh, kind of, you know, uh, if you look at two of those professional levels, NQF 9 and 7 on the top, and look at the differences in how uh, the exit level descriptors align to professional competencies, you can read all about that because I've said it so much that I might just, I'm boring myself. The point here is, that's in the book. Uh, so the RPL model adapts a taxonomy. Now, taxonomy is not ideal when you're looking at transformative pedagogies, but this is what to justify and rationalize within the frameworks that govern us. These things happen. So I'm always self-critical, but it's not actually a linear sequence. These things can happen simultaneously and interchangeably. And that goes on. But what I want to actually say is one thing the model does, it takes the SACAP competencies, groups them into, into fewer, and focusing more on the process of design rather than the product itself. But this is what you can read. Uh, okay. And there's weightings for architects and other categories of regist uh, registration. I'm going really fast because this, I thought, was 20 minutes, but it's 10. I want to actually focus on the on the last few slides that uh, the lessons learned from my research and having developed this model and critically self reflecting and even critiquing the model I developed itself is that so social justice or agency to, through continual curriculum transformation and learning space disruption is possible by alternative learning pathways. Why? It brings in other communities of learners, not just the mainstream cohort of students leaving school and, and, and articulating through the formal system. I got at UKZ and I run a master's program now where there's a full cohort that came via an alternative learning pathway that don't have an honors into a master of architecture by coursework. They're coping well and they're bringing in all their practice experience there and, and also their experiences from struggles in communities. Um, and I call this the critical learning community a very inclusive community. This diagram was developed in my PhD some years back, but it actually relates to various uh, um, various domains or various overlapping uh, aspects of, of the context in which we live locally and globally. And RPL sits right there uh, as a mechanism for engagement and widened access, spatial transformation and redress. So, when we think about alternative learning pathways, uh, transformative pedagogies, there's a need to, to disrupt, okay? We'll come back to, and, and, uh, to that. But two ethical questions we gotta ask ourselves because this is about ethics. Where does knowledge reside? So the knowledge that we're trying to protect and so safeguard, where does that knowledge come from in the first place? Think about it very carefully. Are we protecting knowledge quality, our profession, or really, our insecure, or are we actually protecting our insecurities fueled by the fruits of privilege? So we're going to think about that. What are we protecting? Um, one of the uh, projects I'm currently uh, busy with is called the Learning City Concept, and it relates to Durban now, which I was part of uh, getting the UNESCO Global Learning Cities Award, and looking at the social experiential learning in diverse communities and spatial experiential learning. So I, I talk about the city as a gallery of alternative learning spaces. Now it doesn't have to be the city, it could be any context. 
But key to that are informal and non-formal learning spaces. So it's about deconstructing the learning spaces themselves out of the institutions to reveal diverse layers and narratives through being, dwelling, and interaction with built form and place. And our students need to be there. Quite a few of the projects we've seen over the past two days speak to this. So let us never steal from, and I'm using the word steal from, repackage and shortchange society. We really got to think of ourselves as researchers, uh, facilitators of learning, students. What do we do? Really, what do we do? And I'm saying give back more. Let your PhD fight for social justice through agency. Give, give, give. It is OK to swim against the tide. I've been doing that all my life. All it does is that discomfort builds strength and resilience. So it is, it is a fight. It is a fight for social justice. There's no social justice without a fight. But don't do a PhD to tick a box to get a promotion or, or for, for self-enrichment. Do not, I don't think that's actually stealing from society who invests in you doing something about their uh, you know, harsh realities. So disruption is necessary. But with disruption, disruption is not always outside us. It's also about continuous self-reflection, self-critique, and self-evaluation. And that requires us values. Values of firstly respect, respect for all, everything. Acknowledgement of where knowledge lies and the skills and potentialities of everybody that you engage with. And it's about being inclusive, not exclusive. The foundations for those values would be morality, ethics, and actually spirituality because it's how we engage at conscious level with everything and everyone. So that brings the end to my presentation. The chapter talks more about the technical aspects of RPL and the model development, but I needed to say these things about what really drives my research. So questions, please. Oh, not Thank yet. You. Thank yeah, you. So we will. So we do have an online video uh, from Michelle Gorman, Yolanda Morkel, Hermie Delport, and Lindy Osborne Burton, firstly, and then we'll open the Q&A. Everyone online, please feel free to put in your comments or questions, and then we will attend to them afterwards. Good afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on your location. Our chapter, The Radically Inclusive Studio, an open access conversation between Cape Town, New York, and Brisbane, was co-authored in the height of the global pandemic in July of 2020, almost three years ago, for the Rutledge Companion to Architectural Pedagogies of the Global South, edited by Ariad Harris, Ashraf Salama, and Anne Gonzalez Lara. The world as we knew it was turned upside down in 2020. The four of us met in May 2020 during an online conference titled Teaching Architecture Online, Methods and Outcomes. Our work resonated and we started conversing and then working together on a research project entitled The Radically Inclusive Studio, an open access conversation on radically inclusive practices in the architectural design studio. We are four academics and architects from three continents. Armi Dalport from the University of Cape Town, Yolanda Morkel from Studio Durbanville, Michelle Gorman from Parsons School of Design, and Lindy Osborne Burton from Queensland University of Technology. Although the sudden pivot from on ground to online learning settings was achieved with unexpected ease and acceptance during the 2020 pandemic, this transition exposed structural inequalities which demanded a reset of the traditional architectural design studio model. As four design academics located in the global north, USA, and Global South, South Africa and Australia, we responded through our shared feminist position, practices and values. We employed collaborative autoethnography as methodology and drawing on Williams et al's inclusive excellence framework, we developed a 6S conceptual framework. We used this framework of systemic, structural support, social justice, symbolic, and spatial inclusive contexts to analyze 22 recorded online webinar discussions hosted by architectural education associations during the first months of the pandemic. Drawing on this data, 
a systematic literature review, and our feminist practices, we identified the most prominent inclusive practices within each inclusive context to propose a 6S inclusive mesh that exemplifies our aspirations for an open, flexible, and adaptive curriculum for a radically inclusive design studio. Bell Hooks defines radical pedagogy as truly including a recognition of differences, those determined by class, race, sexual practice, nationality. She demanded that we speak from our own experiences and to listen, to trans transgress accepted boundaries and create the space to enter the conversation, making points of connection with people by continuously crossing boundaries of class, race, and gender. We define our proposal of a radically inclusive studio as a democratic and intentional process to develop a global community representing perspectives at the margins of design, including our own. Rooted in feminist scholarship and critical theory practice through autoethnographic and ethnographic methodologies, we create a radically inclusive framework that responds to the inequ inequ inequities of the design studio which was heightened and amplified by moving the design studio online. We asked the following questions. What does the process of radical inclusion look like across design curriculum and pedagogy? How can online learning settings enable new forms of communication, engagement and collaboration? How do these learning settings inform the change away from former practices which have often been isolating or oppressive? And under which circumstances can flexible, blended, or online learning promote access, opportunity, equity, and inclusion? The design studio reproduces the social hierarchies of the profession, and we look to address the inequities that are revealed by the global pandemic. This has given us the opportunity to give a global rethink on the norms of the architecture and design studio through the six inclusive contexts. Drawing on William, Williams et al's inclusive excellence framework, we formulated a success framework for inclusive contexts, namely systemic, structural, support, social justice, symbolic, and spatial. The systemic inclusive context references our capacity to respond in real time to a changing global context and existing and new barriers within academia and the profession. Nine inclusive practices are proposed within this context, including the need to reward work that reflects varied competencies. And extended through conversation, here discussing the celebration of diversity within the studio as an asset from each of our contexts. In the structural inclusive context, adaptability and flexibility are foregrounded as the underpinning conditions for transformative practices towards a radically inclusive assessment approach. Six inclusive practices, including creating flexibility for individual and unique conditions for our students. We will invite you to join the continuation of the conversation on accommodating adaptive infrastructure for these unique conditions. The support inclusive context reminds us that it is essential that students are placed at the center to ensure their collective me mental health and well being. We started with eight inclusive practices, including employing Ubuntu Curie for collective well being. Here, the start of the conversation that you can join. The social justice inclusive context foregrounds the necessity to implement a decolonized curriculum that challenges the roots of oppression and injustice. Here, the beginning of uh, inclusive practices, uh, including implementing a decolonized curriculum in the design studio, and challenging the roots of oppression and injustice. And here's the start of the conversation that you can join from each of our contexts. Through the symbolic inclusive context, we recognize that architecture, architectural education is a producer of culture and has the unique potential to communicate through design and this representation. 10 inclusive practices, including integrating all forms of knowledge, promoting cultural sharing, 
in building resiliency into the design studio culture. Here, the start of the conversation about recognizing architecture as a producer of culture. Finally, through considering the consideration of the spatially inclusive context, we recognize that exclusionary boundaries such as geography, time, knowledge, uh, and knowledge practices and power relations should be transcended. 12 inclusive practices, including recon recognized prior learning and experience. And here, the start of uh, the conversation on maintaining social presence in online spaces and maintaining a sense of community. As illustrated in our 6S inclusive mesh, the systemic, structural, support, social justice, symbolic, and spatial inclusive contexts are interlaced and exist in entangled relationships with the other, non-hierarchical and codependent. The support, social justice, and symbolic inclusive contexts are close-knit and stitched together by the systemic, structural, and spatial contexts. For us, Presenting the fluidity of the context as an inclusive mesh reflects Akil Mbembe's vision where, as he says, the plasticity of digital forms speaks powerfully to the plasticity of African pre-colonial cultures and to ancient ways of working with representation and mediation of folding reality. In 2021, we started hosting our own workshops to open conversations to voices not being heard. Through active listening, we developed our own RIS framework, hosted online listening sessions and workshops, and began to apply it in our home institutions to address inequities and to act in kindness, generosity, and grace during a, a, and post-pandemic through rethinking the hierarchies of the design re review. as well as building radically inclusive practices into the design studio through gradeless assessment um, and co-designing with our graduate students um, in the process and dismantling power and control from the design syllabus. Co-creating future visioning workshops with our students and faculty um, all through uh, flattening hierarchies between to share, share, the, um, share the discussion. Uh, we share this research openly through the companion website and um, as well as um, the fact that we'll be coming together for an in-person facilitated conversation in Cape Town addressing the need for voices from our South African context, continuing the conversation on how the studio, the signature pedagogy for architectural education and its practices must respond to contemporary conditions and challenges through transformation that considers a radically inclusive approach to learning. So this presentation uh, will be followed by an online in-person facilitated talk in Cape Town on March 22nd, which will build on our current work um, and process towards a radically inclusive studio. We will introduce the radically inclusive studio as a collaborative project uh, with you and invite you to participate um, in online or in person, uh, reflecting on the inequities in the design studio three years from the start of the global pandemic. This research will be used towards the development of a radically inclusive mesh and open design curriculum. Uh, they'll be shared on our website um, and hosted as online design studio between our institutions. We are particularly excited to share our work in this forum and in the context of South Africa, which offers a platform for the kind of conversation that we found was largely absent from the global discussion since the start of the pandemic. Through this exploration, we suggest durable and sustainable strategies for radically inclusive practices in a post-pandemic world. To acquire a more comprehensive knowledge of the 6S conceptual framework for inclusive context, please peruse the ens ensuing conversations on our mirror board. Let's jump into the conversation of what really happening there. Parsons students have initiated reflections, recommendations from their own positioning and questions to the University of Cape Town and Stadio Design students. We invite you as well to contribute to the board asynchronously. By participating, you agree to have your voice heard and shared on our website and in upcoming papers. 
We hope to see you on March 22nd in Cape Town or in the Mira board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, Yolanda, Hermie, and Lindy for that great presentation. Um, I'd like to open up the Q&A now for the, everyone who's here. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, both uh, fascinating presentations, but I have a question for ya Yashin. Is that the correct pronunciation? Not at all. No? <laughs> Correct me. Okay, my dad made up my name. It's Yashane. Think of pain. Yashane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you so much for your presentation. I mean, it's something that I'm particularly interested in. I mean, not not specifically or so much the recognition for prior learning, but the structures and formulations around what's recognised as competence and uh, and how how that competence is identified. And you reference the SACAP competencies. And you also reference the range of competencies and formulations and structures that are that are referenced here. The Commonwealth Association of Architects, mm. the RIBA, um, the CAA, you know, that there is a, there, a, court, there yeah. a range. There seems to me that um, currently, globally, uh, and I speak from a Caribbean experience as well as a UK experience, and then recently an experience here. Um, there, there are, there's a kind of shifting ground about what, what is recognised as sort of legitimate architectural knowledge. Um, I think a lot of the speculation in, in this book, um, this anthology, speaks to these shifting grounds, you know, that this sort of re-evaluation or evaluation of what is professional, what is architecture, what is pedagogy. So my question is really an invitation of your comment on that. Now, recently, I saw that in the United Kingdom, the ARB are radically restructuring professional practice and structure. Uh, the most notice, notable I thing I noticed was that it will no longer be required that you have an undergraduate degree in architecture in order to proceed. So I wanted to hear your reflections on that, that you know, your, you know, what you describe as your method, uh, I think is really fascinating and I, and I welcome it, but with such a kind of shifting landscape, you know, how do we, how do we codify? You know, should we be codifying? Should we, mm. should we unwrap all this and forget about all these elaborate, fanciful structures? Yeah, codification. Okay, I'm not in favour of codification, but the frameworks we have in South Africa, and that's why I, the one slide spoke about transformation hypocrisy, because uh, when we transform here. We, there are so many structures that bind us. I mean, in the formal academic institution, I mean, I'm not sure if you went through curriculum development and, and approval of new programs in South Africa. It is quite an arduous process of ticking many boxes to satisfy many uh, rule makers. Now, I like what's going on in the rest of the world. And um, I often say, the UK, our colonizers, are trans have been transforming faster than us for much longer than us. Uh, that's a bold statement to make regarding architectural education, but it's a reality. They had more flexible models that, than we have had, and they've been doing it for a long time. Um, architecture is inherently interdisciplinary. So it draws on, on and, and that's why I asked about where does knowledge reside. So, you know, drawing from different places, bringing in completely different nuanced ways of thinking, because every citizen or every person, every being experiences architecture by living. We can't avoid it. We, uh, we produce our, our built environments and we also uh, a kind of, uh, I don't want to say controlled, but we, we socio-spatially interact and culturally interact with built form all the time. So every person uh, has some knowledge of architecture and some kind of opinion or attitude about the reality of their existential space, the phenomenological environment, etc. So I don't want to give you uh, an answer of what my position is, but I think we really need to break out of this kind of stereotypical framework guided approach, which my model speaks to because it's it refers to the South African context, into something that is much more inclusive. It, it also has to 
to break the learning spaces that are institutionalized by taking architectural pedagogy and learning environments out in the communities, et cetera. And that will also determine on the length of actual focused architectural studies, because what we may be studying in the first three years may be something very different to the, to the formal, a generally benchmarked South African architectural curriculum. It's still very much similar across. So I don't know if I answered your question, but my thinking, I'm fascinated by those movements. Uh, and that's why I say transformation, hypocrisy, because uh, we're not really, we need to change certain attitudes. Yeah. I've got one more question yeah. as well, which I, sh I shared yesterday with Harriet and some others, um, an experience I had uh, about three years ago at a university in the United States, where a master's graduating student presented in summary um, an uh, app that he had invented um, that could formulate what he claimed was every possible formulation, spatial formulation of a kitchen in terms of scale, dimensions, location of window, location of door. And he'd also researched every possible software program that would do a kitchen design. So IKEA, for example, have software that will design your kitchen for you using their systems. And his claim was, because of the extent of his research, that he could design any any kind of kitchen instantly. You could tell him, you know, he wanted to have Zimbabwe granite countertops and pine face cupboards and your kitchen was, I don't know, a meter wide and 30 meters long and he could instantly produce a design. Um, and it speaks to technology and it speaks to the interface of technology and what we understand to be practice and what we understand to be the embedded skills of a professional architect. Um, and it, it challenges those ideas. Half the panel wanted to fail him. Half the panel said it wasn't architecture. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the other half were wildly enthusiastic about his venturousness and his, the entrepreneurial nature of his project. So I'm just using that to illustrate, I guess, the context of my question, which is how does technology and AI technology impact on the position that you have adopted in, in your formulation of a possible scenario for practice? So AI, if we're thinking about production of kitchens or whatever, AI will be much quicker than us because it's learning fast, right? Artificial intelligence is really quick. But where architects and archi I'm going to talk about architectural thinking and design thinking. I think that's where our focus should be. It's on design thinking and what constitutes design thinking and where does design thinking come from and can, what can we do with it? Um, it's South Africa again. We are spoiled because we are creating products of architecture conventionally. In other places, architectural thinking is doing many other wonderful things. Um, I'm trying to kind of context contextualize your question in relation to my presentation, which is specifically on a, so what AI could do with this is, my thinking around this model could easily be adapted, and that's what that was an intention anyway, through this kind of uh, um, uh, technological application to roll it out. But um, I think as architectural thinkers, we are, must always realize that everything is a process that's open and constantly transforming. So there could never be an ideal solution. Uh, so I don't know where I stand on, on whether the app is, is, a, is a product of architecture. If it had the underpinnings of design thinking, it's a process, not the product. So I would I really like to have a look at that. Because if the process, I teach research methods as well in architecture, and if the process is about thinking architecturally and being socially connected through technology, then that could be a wonderful architectural pro project. But if it's a product as an app, then I'd say no. Mm. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so I really enjoyed how you, you mentioned the exclusion of the disadvantaged people from the educational space mm. hinders the development of those areas that they come from. And even in this conversation now with AI or the kitchen scenario, there are many ways the kitchen can exist, especially from different cultural backgrounds. So the more people that are allowed within the architectural educational space, the more ways we can imagine the way the kitchen can look. But in that, um, I wanted to know, I wasn't very clear in the presentation as to what are these alternative ways in which we can start to introduce 
the transfer of knowledge architecturally and the qualification of being able to create these spaces in the real world context? Yeah, I like two words there, Qual uh, transfer and creation. I think those are two uh, very uh, stifling terms in architecture, which we all have been kind of indoctrinated into in a way, because knowledge transfer, okay, is not a linear process. Uh, and that's why I use the word, st word stealing from place and repackaging it. For example, the different cultural, uh, the cultural interp interpretations of a place for cooking, which we call kitchen. Um, you know, it, there's layers to it. That could be, a, could be an architectural research project on its own. And it could draw on indigenous knowledge. So that's where my decolonial work and inclusive cities is, uh, comes in, because I cannot patronize the knowledge of, 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 of a community that has layers of indigenous knowledge. So I wrote a paper on uh, rural, uh, you know, the post-pandemic uh, schooling system in rurality. So I read up about the frameworks again, government frameworks. They're using the urban model for rural schooling. And it always rural is deprived, dependent, doesn't have anything we have to depend. But when you really look at rurality, there are layers of, of evolved indigenous knowledge systems coexisting with nature and all of that. that we have to start. So it's about that thinking mm -hmm. about uh, architecture and things. So knowledge transfer, in fact, we are taking and we're giving back very much later as experts, and we shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. I think knowledge comes from there. But there was a second part. What was it? So um, transfer and one. Is it creation? As a word yeah, creation. I, I think our creativity must be responsive. Uh, and, and I like Chris Alexander's work a lot. If you look at his PhD, um, which then translated in a book called Notes on Synthesis of Form. Uh, so his PhD, he's a mathematician, you know that, and an architect, right? His PhD was in a village in India. He, he was trying to kind of uh, define what is beauty in architecture through codification and things. And all he could end up in the end, he said, he couldn't. All he could do was identify and fix misfits in something that works as a system. And as architects, how often do we do that? We generally impose, right? Every line is an imposition in society. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's like radical rethinking of what we do. There was a hand up uh, there and yeah, so, sorry. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Cool. I'm Yola. <laughs> Uh, my question is regarding the transformation of um, uh, urban planning, um, especially in townships. Mm. What are your thoughts on how um, the economic development of townships and, and inclusion of people who dwell in townships in the mainstream economy can be influenced using architecture? Um, and a second question, the AI and, and apps tend to have the same biases that the creators of those, mm. the, those technologies uh, carry themselves. And the dangers uh, pop up in my mind when um, uh, uh, the gentleman in front of me mentioned that uh, invention of would there not be a recreation and, and, and um, you know, a repetition of the same mistakes that have happened in the apartheid spatial planning, for example, that we have here. And how do you avoid that with that AI? Hmm. Good question. So the first one is about the socioeconomic kind of transformation of townships, you say. Yeah, again, disconnection is the problem, serious problem. There needs to be more engagement, collaboration, also interdisciplinary engagement. So if you look at the way architects work here, uh, typically we, we follow certain other set frameworks that planners and, and, um, and others do, infrastructural frameworks. And there's a general, if you look at the town planning schemes, fortunately I am in the School of Built Environment and studies at UKZ and we have planning, housing, community development, development studies, population studies and all of that. So you get different perspectives. There's a lot of community engaged work in community development that we overlap with to know what the community's issues are. But one thing that comes through is first of all, we are a 
disconnected as disciplines, all trying to pr protect our own domain and give to the needy. So we're always seeing communities uh, as dependent. And the more deprived that communities are, the more expert we become, right? And more valuable, right? So it's about collaboration and engagement. Um, and without that kind of engagement, uh, transformations are going to happen. The other problem we have is that if you look at the, the, the town planning, uh, what they call it, the schemes that, that govern all the areas, they need some kind of deconstruction and repackaging. What they tend to do is they try to fix fundamentally flawed things as we go along. Even the way urban design, so urban design and urban analysis is something that intrigues me a lot, to which I think architecture fits in, right? Uh, but there needs to be, okay, let's put it this way. Architects need to be much more humble and less um, self-referential, less star, let's put it that way. Um, I think architects need to <laughs> change their, uh, I don't know, why do people just don't not like us generally? You know, <laughs> something's wrong. Obviously, we can't. It's like we, the one light against all the lights coming, and we are correct. You know what I'm saying? So, so we need to have that con. It's a very key point. AI, yeah, and Chat GPT and all that. When you look at Chat GPT and the conversations, I think let's leave this for another conversation. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to speak again. But that one. That second question, both in fact, could take me three hours or more. I could have a fun with this, but more interactive than me sitting with a mic. Thank you, Dr. Lucan. Um, so we are ending panel two.